Oh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon in North Georgia, maybe morning where you are. Well, welcome to our February live chat. Uh, we're going to be exploring halftones today. Halftones are those mysterious lights uh, between center light and shadow. So let me give me give you just a little bit of a, a heads up before we get started. And that is especially to those people who are not members yet. Uh, members already know this, but if you want to become a member, uh, you go to the uh, go to our channel in the Studio Art Instruction. Uh, I should say YouTube.com uh, slash in the Studio Art Instruction, and click on Join. And for four ninety four ninety nine a month, uh, you get a free video lesson every month. You get a free snippet every month, a snippet from a video lesson, and you get to participate in the live chat. Only members get to ask questions. So uh, if, you, if you're not a member, you want to join, you can join at any time. You can actually join now if you want to. And now to members, welcome. Get ready to ask your questions, but not quite yet. Uh, we're going to do uh, this live chat a little bit different from the way we've done, uh, well, we've only done two so far. This is our third. We're going to show you a just a very short little video that explains halftones. So uh, if you will, just watch the video and then after the video, have your questions ready. Are we ready for the video? Ma Maestro? Okay, here we go. Halftones are found in our environment's response to degrees of light. In direct light, we can predict where the halftones are going to be. So we see this full diagram here of a sphere being lit with the center light right here and the terminator right here all those areas of degrees of light between the terminator, which is where shadow starts, and the center light are halftones. In order to have a language uh, with which we can talk about not only halftones, but also degrees of values we find in shadows, uh, we have value scales. We know that uh, there are several value scales available to us, uh, some are numbered between 1 and 5, some are numbered between 1 and 7, but the most uh, valuable one for understanding halftones is the one that uh, divides all the value er, intervals, you might say, uh, into 10 different values. Now, the shadow values live on one side of the value scale, on this side right here, and the values that are not in shadow live in here. These are created by how the light, or how the environment, is responding to the light. Then we can see and read the values that fall in that area between shadow and center light. So on the value scale, we indicate one as the center light. That's the lightest light we will ever see on anything, usually directly aligned with the light rays coming from the light source. And then as an, uh, uh, an image turns away, as the planes of the image or the image itself turns away from that center light, it becomes a little bit darker and a little bit darker and a little bit darker. And that's where those half tones come in. The halftone uh, label was given somewhere around uh, the time in history when uh, it became necessary to reproduce uh, halftones for publication or uh, such as newspapers or reproductions. So it's a language that is relatively new to our culture, nevertheless has stuck. Uh, and so what we can uh, the way, one way we can think about it is that the tones between, or you could in some say halfway between, all those tones halfway between the center light 
and the shadow or the terminator, all of those values are half tones. The only problem with that kind of identifying half tones is that not always are we going to find everything in direct light. And so we have to divide the kinds of half tones then into those that are predictable under a direct light source and those that are unpredictable under any other kind of light source. Uh, so if the light source is uh, obscured in any way or under a cla under um, some sort of diffusion, uh, all kinds of things can happen in nature to, to change the kind of light source we have. Well, then we find the same values in these areas that we find in the half tones, but they don't really fall under that predictable half tone definition. So that might create a little bit of confusion, but I think if we just think of them as predictable and unpredictable, it gives us more clarity. So we can see here we have um, fog. We see potential half tones uh, right in here with the light shining uh, on that wing. We see half tones all in this area right in here. But we see, well, these are not half tones. These are, these are shadow tones. But these, these are unpredictable half tones because we never know what to look for in, in terms of the value range that we find in fog. Okay, same thing over here. Uh, obviously a snowy scene and the sun's just beginning to come out. Uh, we still have, well, what do we have here? Is it still snowing or is that uh, f fog or um, somehow the light is obscured? We have half tones here. We have a little bit of light reflecting here, but it's better if we just look at that scene in terms of its values uh, rather than try to look in predictable ways that those half tones fall on when there's direct light and there's no other weather condition that is uh, changing how that direct light falls. See the same thing right here, where it's a very foggy morning. We do have a direct light is coming through the fog, but the fog is changing the environment. So that's what I mean by when I said initially how the the light affects or how the environment responds to the light. Here, the environment is responding in a light in in uh, responding to the light in a way that is unpredictable. Nevertheless, if we learn to read the values, the halftone values, we can find them in here. And we see here, same thing, right back in here, we have some halftones. Uh, obviously, fog, the fog is reflecting the light, it's responding to the light, therefore we have the halftone values. Here we have uh, not so much fog, we can feel the light a little bit more predictable, as it would fall on these areas where there is a gradation of light. Uh, and so, and here, of course, same thing. So if we think of those, uh, the half tones as predictable and unpredictable, then we can begin to uh, see the difference between what we can expect to see and what we just need to learn the values for. Now let's discover what happens, what happens to color in halftone areas. This is predictable, in predictable light. Remember that when the light is predictable, you'll see these things happening. When it's unpredictable, you might not see these things happening. So it's important to learn to read what happens in halftones in predictable light. When you're looking unpredictable light, reading the value and the color according to what the light is doing uh, is going to be easier for you when you can read it predictable. Okay, I'm just going to take uh, these pumpkins and show you what is predictable. Now, one thing that is predictable is that remember, the light on, the, on any surface, at, where the light is hitting on any surface, if that surface is curved or if it is flat, uh, the, the degree with which the light rays are hitting, 
the strength of the light rays are going to determine what the hue does. What is the hue in this pumpkin? Uh, well, we can read. We can find the hue right here. And we can read that hue, uh, the, the local color of that hue as orange. Where do we find that local color? We find the local color in that area between uh, the halftone three and transition. That is predictable. So if you can find the areas where it goes into shadow, come up from where it goes into shadow, beyond the transition area, into uh, the halftone three area, that's where you're going to find the local color. So that, you, that is predictable. You can see right here. And we can make a splotch of that local color to work with and show you what happens then as the... Uh, as, as the color moves more and more, as the area moves more and more into light, we can show you then what you can expect, what is predictable. As it moves closer towards the center light, the center light is located right here. Talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. As it moves closer to the center light, as any hue moves closer to the center light, you can expect that hue to get just a little bit warmer. Or think about that. The light is warm. It's shining on it on the surface. It's going to warm the hue as it moves closer to the center light. We can take a splotch right here and, that, and show you right there. You see that gets a little bit warmer than this is. Then as it moves even closer to the center light, as we see it here, it's getting closer. Let's get it a little bit closer. And you, see, you can see that gradation I talked about earlier, that continuum. Okay, it's getting, uh, as it's getting closer to the center light, it's going to lose this hue. So you remember the first thing that happens, you can see it get a little bit warmer, and then it begins to lose its hue. The light rays begin to bleach out the hue. Uh, and bleaches it out many times towards the warm but just look for it begins to lose its local hue and begin something else will be added into it. Now, uh, that what's predictable is that it's going to lose its he local hue. You can see this is no longer the color of pumpkin. This is no longer the hue of the local color of orange or the pumpkin's orange. All right, now let's see, let's move it even closer. We get it right in here to the center light area. And you see it loses even more of its hue. So we can indicate that right here. We're getting closer now. This is this is closer to half tone one. Now we get the half tones begin to kind of overlap here just a little bit. Uh, this is closer to the in between half tone one and the center light. This is closer to about the half tone one, half tone two, and half tone three. So that's why when you think about those as a continuum, on the value scale, we see them divided into intervals, but expect those to just be lines of demarcation. And then within those, sometimes you might see an exact registration, sometimes you might not. As it goes into center light, the closer it gets to center light, the more of its hue it loses. In this particular image, uh, the image itself is not as reflective, and so all the color doesn't disappear in this image. But in a highly reflective surface, you'll see all the hue disappear. And so this is what we found in the center light area of this pumpkin. Now you see what we have there. We have five changes. Well, these two get very close now. So we, we can see that we have five changes in hue as well as in value as that light or as this image moves from close to shadow into center light. And now it's time for you to ask your questions.
I'll be going. There we are. No? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, did that stimulate any questions from anybody? Uh, so, see, we already got a question about the, uh, the, the sampling program that we use, and uh, we answered that. Art Rage 6. So, hello to everybody. Uh, all right, here we go. Um, I wonder if at some point you can discuss whether halftones come into play in painting expanses of water in seascapes. Yes, halftones come into play everywhere. Um, we we study the um, we study halftones in a predictable on a predictable subject in order to be able to read them in order to be able to determine uh, what value degree uh, a half tone is mainly that but you can certainly determine it on surfaces of water you got to remember that surfaces of water are reflections of their environment and and uh, it's sometimes the surface of the water also tells us something about the depth of the water but tells us uh, more about the reflection uh, of the environment and we can see well we can't make any rules about that but the important thing to be able to do is to look at the various parts of the water and determine uh, what, what, value, uh, what value range you're seeing that in and then determine the color of that value range. So um, I hope that will cover it. Uh, Lisa says, if you have a background which is the lightest dark, will that help you to know which way to go with light or dark? Um, actually, more than the background of light and dark is what the light source is doing. What the light source is doing is going to uh, determine more, or going to help you determine more about what to do with halftones themselves. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, we know that we have all kinds of light sources. We have a direct light source. The sun, if we're outside, is going to be our direct light source. Well, uh, that direct light source is shooting rays and how those rays, to the degree that those rays are hitting a surface, determines uh, their value and their color. Determines what we see as their value and their color. So, uh, if, you, if you mean background in terms of distance there, uh, what's going to happen in distance is that the environment, or the particles in the environment, are going to get involved with how they influence uh, the the light and how the light is shining on the surface and whether we see the uh, what degree of value we see those in half tones. So uh, in painting, when we're when we're doing an interpretation rather than an observation, now there is a difference. When you're doing an interpretation, you might make a value adjustment, say. In a still life, you might make a value adjustment in the background, but I uh, hope I didn't make that too confusing. What do you mean when you say something else is added? When, a, when, a, uh, when moving towards center light and losing hue. That has to do with whether the surface is uh, re highly reflective or whether the surface is more absorbent. Now, what I didn't did not cover in that video is the uh, uh, what, how surfaces behave when light hits them. There, we have the light rays that come in and hit the surface, and we know that the strength, or the, 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 uh, how direct those ray, rays are hitting the surface depends on how light the surface will be. So if, it's, if the part of the surface is in the direct alignment with the light, that's the center light. So how reflective that's going to be uh, or, or let's say another way, that surface is going to be on the extreme highly reflective or on the other extreme highly absorbent. So, and, and sometimes the surface is bo both reflecting and absorbing light. So we have, that's a texture of a surface. You might call it a, a textural quality of a surface. So if a surface is highly reflective, then it's going to absorb more light than it reflects, 
and we won't see that center light quite so light. And that's what I mean when I say other things uh, other things enter into it. I said it a different way. Um, she said other things added to it or whatever. Yeah. Also, other things that can happen uh, that are unpredictable are other colors reflecting in. If there, if there are colors, if there's a, an image of a different color right beside an image, that color might be the... the reflection, the light reflecting off that image onto this, onto the image we're talking about, could be influencing the color. Let me say something else right here, so this is a good place to insert this. About light sources, we have, we have a direct light source, but we will also have secondary and tertiary light sources that we might not be aware of. There, and, but these are influ influencing the color sometimes, so we need to pay attention to those. A secondary light source would be something like the sky, which is also helping to illuminate. And then a tertiary light source might be uh, other things around that that would be reflecting color onto a surface. So that's what I mean when I said uh, other things enter into it too. Um, okay. Laura, uh, Laura says, do you have any suggestions for exercises to practice finding halftones more quickly and accurately? The best way uh, is to study something that's predictable. Now, and to, then when you study it, here's some things to look for. And, and a good, really, a real good, a real good uh, subject for that is a tomato, a, a red tomato, or. Um, uh, any, any kind of fruit. I started to say apple, but apples usually have little spots and variations on them. But some kind of fruit that has a surface that doesn't have variations on it. Now, and so you can put that um, on a, under a light source. You could say a red tomato and get a lamp that doesn't have uh, maybe a, kind of a narrow, a lamp that has kind of a narrow shade on it. Don't hold it too close. Get it uh, sort of a, a good distance from the tomato, and then study. Look for the look for the uh, center light. That of course would be the lightest part that is being reflected on that. And then if you use uh, if you get uh, a three by five card, I don't have a hole puncher here, but punch a hole in a three by five card, something like this. And you could actually punch two holes, but one to start with. Then close one eye and hold this uh, so that you can look through and see the image, see the tomato, in this case, if that's what you're using. Close one eye and isolate the color in particular uh, areas of that tomato, and you will actually see that there is a hue change and a value change. And it, this is one of the simplest ways to discover what the variations in half tones do as they as the light moves across the surface from the center light. Of course, we're talking about surfaces that have some sort of curvature to them. Those are the ones that are more predictable. Now, when we can learn uh, to register in our minds, like we would register the amount of salt to put on food or something like that, we can learn to register in our minds, uh, recognize various halftones by just looking at them and seeing them. But in order to be able to do that, we need to study something specific like I just described to you in order to be able to see it. So that, that's the kind of exercise I recommend. Um, another way, I did give an exercise in this and yesterday's uh, newsletter quick tip. So those of you that are on the mailing list can check back and do that, do that exercise, which is an excellent one to do where you would be using one image under different kinds of light sources and use, these, use the isolator to discover or to uh, detect those value and hue changes that happen between the center light and the shadow area. Okay, what would, uh, Joni, would the reflection of the water also have half tones? Yes, it will. Remember the water is reflecting the environment. And so it certainly is going to have half tones. Have, think of half tones as values, values that have color. Well, they don't have to have color, but think of half tones as values. Let me hold this up. Well, just, this one, this one's a better one. Um, so if 
if you're if you're referring to a value scale such as this, then you see the half tones are in this value range right in here. Now those half tones are caused by light. Doesn't matter what the color of the surface is, those half tones are caused by light. And so you can then uh, learn learn to detect. Now you know white when you see it. I'm sure all of you can recognize white when you see it. You know that white is equivalent to center light. If the light, as I described to you earlier, if the light is reflecting uh, directly on the surface, and you'll see that on water too, where the water is reflecting white, it's reflecting light. But then learn how to read the next interval uh, towards shadow. The next interval towards shadow, this value right here, we call that value 2 on this 10 value scale. If I say value 2 to you, imagine what value 2 is. And then uh, learn to recognize that value 2 as you see it in various colors. Then learn to recognize value 3. That's an interval even a little bit darker towards the uh, shadow area. And learn to recognize value 4. Learn to recognize... See what I'm saying there? If we learn to recognize a value when we see it according to grit, what it's half tone or even it's shadow, but today we're talking about half tones. If you learn to read that as where it belongs in the half tone range, then you'll know when you, whether you're looking on water or whether you're looking at foliage or whether you're looking at uh, um, anything, the desert, uh, anything, sky, you'll be able to then recognize what half tone you're looking at, and that should inform you also about uh, what co what color or what hue you can expect in the half tone, um, depending on its environment. I hope I answered that right. Let's see where what else do we have there. Indeed, Denim says thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Why do some artists suggest using warm shadows and cool? Why do some artists suggest using warm shadows and cool local color? We have what we call observation and we have what we call interpretation. Now, I don't want to uh, confuse you about that. This is about observation. It's learning how to observe what, what you see in front of you. Then, uh, artists also have interpretation. And interpretation is taking what you see in front of you and reinterpreting it maybe a little bit differently. Um, warm, cool interpretations, for example. So that is about your painting. That's about composition, how you handle a composition in your painting. The observation part of it is how you feed information uh, into the artist in you. You feed it information so that you know then you have the ability to make decisions about interpretation. So yes, uh, there are artists that do recommend that. Now, uh, what we can normally look for, if we're observing, normally when we're looking for warm light, uh, when we see warm light, direct light, when we're observing, we also recognize that those shadows are going to go a little cooler. But then when we're looking at, say, an overcast sky where the light is cooler, then we can observe that the cool light, being where the cool light is being deprived in the shadows, feels and seems a little bit warmer. Um, so maybe I didn't do, do, confuse you too much on that. Um, could you talk about Bougaro, Bougaro, I hear it pronounced all different kinds of ways. What do you want me to say about him, Lisa? Used half tones, you can barely see it. It's three part. Well, yes, yes, yes. Um, the half tones. You've got to remember that cla he's a classical painter. Classical painters, um, classical painters use the half tones, and they use uh, depending on the painter, use them brilliant, brilliantly. But they use the half tones, um, they blend the half tones so that you're not aware of one going into the other. But they are using the half tone principles. If you'll observe the skin tones, um, you will observe that as the skin tone, well, of course, there, there might be a reinterpreting of skin tones. 
like sometimes uh, a classical painter will reinterpret skin tones in a cooler range. But those skin tones, as they're moving into the halftone areas, uh, will be slightly changing in hue. And you can notice that if you look at it really, really closely. Um, okay, Cheryl, could you go over halftones found in the continuum versus incremental steps, how halftones can be found not in sequential order? Yes, that is a good uh, good question. I'm glad you asked that one, Cheryl. Um, halftones are not exact. Um, what I didn't show in this video is that all values as we see them and all colors as we see them are in a continuum. They go, they are gradually, they gradually gradate one to the other. We use the language of half tone one, half tone two, half tone three in order to be able to discuss and identify how the image might be changing as light is passing over the image. So uh, the the incremental stuff, I don't have a diagram. I do have a diagram somewhere. The incremental stuff is is to help us to discuss it. But, uh, half tones in their range uh, might be gradually m merging one into the other on a gradating scale. And that is the natural movement of half tones, just as the natural movement of color might do the same thing. So I thought I had an illustration. I guess I don't have an illustration of that. So it's not a cut and dry thing, uh, finding halftones and learning to read what's happening in the halftone. It's a continuum. So that center light is continuum, gradually grading the halftone one, half tone one. Half tone one is joining and merging with that area that we that we chunk up and call halftone two. So we we learn to put them in intervals in order to be able to discuss them. It's sort of like in music. Oh, here's a good example, a really good example of that in music, of those of you who are interested in music. Um, a piano has distinct tones, and we, we know that we can hear the intervals between those distinct tones. Say, for example, from C uh, to C sharp to D in that direction. We can hear on a piano. But a violin is able to, to continue those tones, slide the finger from C to C sharp and G, and that is the continuum. So that would be a good uh, analogy, if you might say. Uh, one of the, the, um, um, the horn instruments, such as a, um, a trumpet, can do the same sort of thing, a trombone, where they can slide the tones, whereas a clarinet, has got the tones set. I'm going to get myself in deep trouble, so I better stop that analogy right there. Um, I think we're getting back to the origin of the name halftone. Yeah, getting back to the origin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I th uh, Lisa says, I think they should be considered half lights. Yes, I didn't name them half tones. <laughs> I agree. Uh, they should be, well, maybe not half lights, because then that suggests that maybe. Uh, sequential lights or something like that. But the halftone language is there, like so much of the language in it that we use, our visual language, our visual terms. The language is there, so we just think of it as nothing in, in the world but nomenclature. Joni, um, is the gradation predictable in regard to the value of intervals? So you will have a two, three, four, five value with each element Maybe so, maybe not. It could be, depending on what you're looking at, if I understand the question right, Joni, dep depending upon what you're looking at, you, you might be looking at something that is kind of sitting in between an interval, you know? Uh, might, you, you, a value might, but you don't have to be precise. That's the neat thing about painting. We don't need to be that precise uh, when we're translating or when we're painting and we're aware of what half tones are doing. So yes, something that you're observing might be sitting in the interval between two and three or one and two and so on. Uh, but the important thing is to recognize its general location. Uh, I hope I answered that one. Uh, Lynn, do you suggest limiting values to groups of values for the purpose of creating easier read, easier to read painting? Yes. 
not only just for easier to read painting, but this is the way nature does. Nature groups values. Um, when we say grouping value, we mean that shadows are grouped together. Shadow values are grouped together. Um, half tones values are grouped together. And sometimes people group them in three ranges. It would be a lighter range, usually something like about a, maybe a value of four to one grouped together. All the values that you see there grouped as a single grouping. And then maybe the middle range that might go from say four to seven grouped, something like that. There's, there's no uh, exact rule about that. But the idea of, of not trying to show every single value, that's not even the point of this lesson. The point of this lesson is to, to enable you to identify these and to know what to expect of them. What you can expect, for example, when you look at, uh, when you're looking at foliage, green foliage in the summertime, won't we be glad when summertime arrives, at least spring, here, uh, when you're looking at foliage, in, in uh, the green foliage, you're not gonna see this, you do not see the same hue of green where the sun is hitting it really strong, sun rays are hitting it strong, as you do where the sun rays are not hitting it quite so strong. Uh, and you will not see the same hue where, they're, they, where it's in shadow. The hue changes. We're, it's still in the green range, unless it's uh, in the fall where you've got multiple colors of, on the tree. But the hue actually changes as a, depending on how much light is hitting that particular area. And so what this study is for, more than anything else, is to help you to learn to read that change. And remember I said, expect it to change. Expect uh, as a half tone is moving from the terminator, from, from the transition towards light, you can expect the hue to change. Maybe the change won't be very much, but it will change somewhat. And when I say change, uh, the hue may be moving a little bit more towards a neighboring, analogous hue, towards a little bit more towards a neighboring hue, or in some cases the, the hue might even be changing in intensity. It may be changing in, in, in a couple of ways, but the important thing is that you don't just see a green tree and assume that you're going to show the light in that tree just by adding white to it. This will make all the difference in the world in the richness of your painting when you can learn to recognize the degree of light that's hitting a surface and how the halftones uh, react or respond to that degree of light, depending, depending on the environment and what's going on in the environment. Okay, Joni, like every element, uh, like every element be included in each element, whoops, with a, will every halftone value be included in every element no, not every half tone value will, because it all depends upon what the light's doing. So, uh, if you meant by element, did you mean by image, or did you mean a visual element? It, now, in the visual elements, that's a, that would be a different question, different answer. Clarify for me, Joni, when you say element, are you talking about visual elements, or are you talking about the... Uh, are you talking about images, various elements of an image? Uh, meant to say, I'm waiting. <laughs> um, nope. You're just now coming across. Oh, I'm just now coming across. All right. Yeah, but I'll be coming across again. <laughs> okay. Um, so, a visual element. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Okay, good. Yeah, all right, let's think about what the visual elements are. And uh, um, it depends on the, if you, you have a shape, if you have a shape, how are you gonna see the shape? You can't see the shape without light, right? So you can expect half tones within the shape. If you have textures, you can't, you can't really see the textures without light. If, if the textures are in, uh, if the textures are in, are being reflected, or if they are reflecting light, even reflecting and absorbing light, there are going to be halftones there. Um, line and direction are more movement activities, so you wouldn't expect halftones there. But I would say where whatever element that uh, is about the description of the image, whatever element participates 
And what we see in imagery, um, you can expect to, half tones to be there. Where if you see color, you'll probably you're going to see half tones, unless it's in shadow. If it's in shadow, you're not going to see half tones. Oh, I forgot that part too. Yes, half tones are only those areas that are between the shadow area and the center light area. So when we're talking about half tones, we're not talking about the shadow areas. All right, uh, probably skirted across that one. Have you run out of questions? Mm -hmm. Everybody's run out of questions? That's yeah. not, not totally not a good place to be. You have the half tones above your head there. I have half tones above my head. I do have half tones above my head. Oh, that would be a good thing to refer to. You're welcome, Joni. <laughs> that would be a, a really good thing to refer to. Um, you can see... Uh, above my head, we have the background here. Uh, have a background with, with the diagram. I think it's the same. Is that the same diagram? No, it's not the same diagram we showed on the video. It's a different mm -hmm. one. Um, so when we're talking about half tones, you see that group there above my head that is referring to where is it? Um, which side is it on? Is it on this side over here? <laughs> <laughs> over here. Over here. It's on your. That's, that's shadow right over here exactly. okay y'all you can start giggling at me now the thing is there we go I've got it <laughs> we've got the half tones grouped I got them labeled for you can read it half tones are grouped the shadow tones are grouped now that is a diagram we take the diagrams with grains of salt diagrams only uh, only existent in order to help us to gain an understanding of some sort. And so, um, so that's what we're talking about there. Okay, uh, Cheryl, considering value instead of halftone in unpredictable light, how do we define halftones in unpredictable light? Yeah, all right. That comes with having, having learned to recognize halftones in predictable light. Now, we said in unpredictable light, we're going to have a variation. We're going to have values. We're going to have, uh, um, we're going to have either a narrow degree of value differences or we're going to have a large degree of value differences. But when we can learn to recognize a value as a value, uh, as a halftone. For example, if I say now, if I say to you halftone three, can you register that value in your head? I mean, like you could recognize anything else you learn to recognize. If I say the color blue, you can recognize that. See, you've learned to do that. We started doing that when we were kids, didn't we? But if I say halftone blue, a blue in halftone. If I say a blue in halftone free, now. A blue in halftone free, can you recognize that? If I say a blue in halftone four. Suppose I say a gray in halftone two. That's what I mean. If you, you know, once you carry yourselves through a drill of studying half tones, you will eventually be able to recognize them when you see them in unpredictable areas. And then here's the importance of that: that relationship helps you to interpret that unpredictable area. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. I have a photo that um, has some of that unpredictable half tone in it. Hang on just a minute, let me find that photo. Um, hold on, here we go, here we go. All right, there, this photo, uh, this photo is relatively unpredictable in half tones. So you can see uh, it, it is more predictable than if it had the light rays showing through. Uh, now you remember the photo in the, in the video that had the light rays showing through? Those were unpredictable because they didn't have a gradation or they didn't have a sequence of gradation. They were, the half tones were different because depending upon uh, how strong the light was that was showing through them. But here you can see that the, you can see there is mist or uh, of some sort. There are many, many particles in the atmosphere between here and here causing these images to change and get lighter in value. And if you'll notice now, not only getting lighter in value, they're also, the hue is changing as well. 
So if you can, uh, if you can once you learn to read the half tones as the area in which they exist, you'll be able to read this and interpret that in a way in your painting that can show distance. You can show mountains in a mist in the distance. Uh, so that's one thing. And also, if you want to show light, light rays coming through fog, which is a beautiful thing, uh, then the, the degree of difference between uh, where one bunch of rays is coming through and where another bunch of rays is coming through, you'll be able to show that by reading the intervals, by seeing the intervals between them, by being able to to know, to tell by the fact that you can read it if that bunch of light rays is in a half tone one area, which is about a value of two-ish continuum, or if it's in a half tone four area. If there's a half tone four area that is streaming beside a half tone two area, that value difference that you show is going to help the viewer then to interpret that, to read that as you meant to express it. Um, Laura, do, do you ever push tones up one, up one for an interpretation? If so, what would be the benefit? Um, I'm not going to say you would or wouldn't. Uh, if you want to give something more contrast than it's showing, uh, the half tones, like a half tone one against a half tone four or three, is is a, is a stronger contrast than a half tone one against a half tone two. So if you had a reason in any subject that you wanted to you wanted to express a different uh, a stronger contrast, stronger value contrast, then yes, but that would that's a composing decision and would depend upon what your purpose would be for wanting that to happen in a painting. Um M Melissa, what is the difference between shadow and diffused light? Uh, sh shadow and diffused light as a source. Well, um, shadow is where the image is deprived of light rays. Now, diffused light. Let me do, address diffused light first. Let's imagine what diffused light is. Uh, what happens that causes a light to be diffused? You have a you have to have a direct light. I think you do. Yeah, you have a direct light, a light that's coming, and then something is stopping those light rays and causing them to move in all different directions, diffusing them. Like you you you, you see the uh, the the diffusers that we find on uh, lights, on uh, fluorescent lights especially. If we take that diffuser off, you get that heart. Those harsh beams come down. When you put those diffusers on, that what they're doing is breaking up the rays of light. So rays of lights are, are going in all different directions. They're unpredictable directions. That's diffused light. The same thing happens in the sky uh, on an overcast day. What's happening, the sun is still there. We just don't see it. The sun is still there, and but the cloud cover is between us and the sun. And it's breaking up those light rays. So the light's passing through. It hits those cloud surfaces and it starts shooting in all different directions. That's diffused. And now shadow, shadow areas are areas where light rays can't hit or where direct light rays can't hit. Where the light rays coming from the source, let me say it that way, where the light rays coming from the source can't hit. In shadow areas, we can see it because there'll be reflections of light. The lights, the, 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 what we can see in the shadow, uh, the light is coming from other places. So it's, it's light rays hitting, bouncing in, that's causing us to see the shadow. But you can think of a shadow as being in shade. In shade means the light rays, the, the, light, the light source, the rays of the light source, even if they're bouncing around, they can't hit, they can't hit that area. And so then it begins to fall darker and darker and darker because we can't hit it. So you can think of uh, the fusion as being splitting up the rays, uh, averaging them out, causing them to bounce everywhere and shadow areas that are not able to pick up those rays because they're moving away from them. Uh, maybe that did it. Oh, Lynn says, thank you, that was very helpful. Okay, my pleasure. Marie, 
Do you use the 10 value scale for watercolor as well as other mediums? Yes, most definitely. It's, uh, well, the 10, the 10 value scale, um, it allows us to uh, think in terms of, to, to, it allows us to be a little bit more logical in our thinking and recognizing a value in shadow or what y'all know that I'm used to saying what's in shadow and what's not in shadow. Uh, but because we have divided into 10, uh, like here, because we have divided into 10, and with this little value scale especially, we can think of these areas up here as being those areas that are not in shadow. So we have a wide range of areas that we can work with, and then uh, these down here. So uh, my preference for, especially for thinking in watercolor, working with watercolor, is to think in terms of, of of a, a wider range of value possibilities uh, rather than the uh, the narrow range. Okay, uh, is that Phil McNally? P. P. Uh, are half tones and neutrals the same thing? No, neutrals are referring to um, colors that have either very little hue, or no hue in them left in them are very little here. So what you have right here, all of this is neutral. All this is great, this is great, but you see we have 10 degrees of neutral. So we can say that for every, um, we can say that as far as hues themselves go, every hue can also have, uh, the half tones of the hues can have degrees of neutral. For example, um, if we're thinking of the half tones, I'll take any color, half tones of um, mm, a barn, uh, old wood, the wood on the old, old wood on the barn. Usually think unpainted wood on the barn or even a tree trunk, you think of that as being more or less in a neutral. Well, if it leans a little bit more towards warm, it may be a neutralized orange or red orange, very neutralized, but the half tones are still there, the five, at least five values or four, four or five values. That range is still gonna be there uh, even though it's neutral. So that would be the distinction. Uh, Cheryl, I've been pondering on unpredictable light halftones as we are in overcast snowy weather. I bet you are. Cheryl's in Montana. Uh, try to capture, trying to capture the variation on values and hue is challenging. Are you talking about on the snow itself? Um, yeah, and without any direct, you're under indirect light. Yeah, you're right. And you don't have much hue there. My, uh, if, if, if the sky is overcast, at least my experience with observing, or let me say this way, what you can expect when you're observing nature in snow, when the sky is still overcast, you have very little hue, but you do have some hue there. Uh, but there, it will be, when I say hue, it's more neutral, more of what we were just talking about, where the entire landscape uh, has been more or less, the color in the entire landscape has been more or less neutralized. And anything that happens to be sitting there, like a red barn, for example, in that landscape, you can notice that it's not bright red, but it's more of a, of a neutral red. So I think that when you're working with snow, um, you can look for your various hues more in the, in the, in the uh, low saturation range, where the hue is, uh, a lot of the hue is saturated out, and, but you will, you will find, the halftone range is gonna be narrow there too. Uh, because, well, you know, if you're in diffused light, you don't have anything like the light range. And so you've got mo you've got a lot of unpredictable stuff. But you can still, if you use this little isolator idea, I really need to have a hole punched in something. <laughs> if you do use the isolator idea where you, you punch a hole in, in, a, in a card or a piece of paper or something and close your eye and just hold it like this and isolate the landscape and look right through that hole as you move it around like that with one eye closed, isolate, you will discover then, you'll discover what you can't see with your bare eyes because with, when you're looking directly with your eyes, your eyes have a tendency to want to average everything out. But you can really see those differences if you'll just use a little simple tool like that to help you to see it. Melissa, can an image sitting in shallow shadow 
still have a center light and half tones. Well, if it's sitting in shallow shadow, it's not going to have either. You got to remember that half tones live in the lights. Half tones live between the light, uh, the the transition area or the shadow area, and the center light. That's where half tones live. So you can't really have a uh, half tone. Let's see, did I read that right? You couldn't have a center light in shallow shadow. It, they, they're sort of contradictions. You see the difference there? The center light is that brightest light. The center light, the center, it, the center, let's say this is front. You got the light source coming down. It's not the center light. The center light is, is, the, the, is the area on the image that the light source is hitting right straight in the center. That's the reason it's called the center light. So you can see how you couldn't have that in shadow. Uh, I hope that's always true. <laughs> Could you talk about, this is Joni again, Could you talk about how half tones re will react on an overcast day? Yeah, they're going to be really narrow on an overcast day. I would say the best way to study that, well, they're going to be narrow, uh, and, and that's the reason we might even think of them as being, maybe in some cases, unpredictable. Uh, because we, when we use that term predictable, we're talking about a gradation that we can count on. Uh, in, in an overcast, the best way to study them, the half tones, is just what I was just recommending to Cheryl. Cheryl. Was it Cheryl? Melissa. Cheryl. Oh, somebody. <laughs> I think it was Cheryl. That was just to, to actually study them, isolate them, isolate them, and just move that around on an overcast day. That will tell you more about what you're seeing in terms of the degrees of half tones that are there than I can ever uh, tell you. Lisa, uh, so the artist can decide the lightest part of shadows and the darkest part of half tones. Yes, you can. Uh, we do have now. Remember, I want you to, to. I want you to get clear. Get clarity on the distinction between studying what's there and composing your compositions. Now we study. We study what's there so that we can gain knowledge about what we want to do in our compositions. In our compositions, we might want, for some reason, we might want to do a high key composition. A high key composition where the darkest dark might not be any darker than, say, value six or value, value six or even value five. High key composition. Well, in there, you're still, you're going to have a half tone range that you would read as a value scale half tone. Uh, but that is that is a, in that is creating that's uh, that's reinterpreting or what I would call transposing. It's when you transpose an idea from one observation to another. So uh, yes, the artists do all kinds of things with reinterpreting what's that in the real world. Uh, all right, let's see. So he paints the rest of values darker in shadows and lighter in what now? Uh, so an artist can decide the lightest part of the shadows and the darkest part of the half tone. So he paints the rest of the values darker in shadows and oh, and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's uh, um, that is another way. I, I was I, I interpreted it different from the way you said it the first time. Yes, to give a more, uh, uh, more like a, a Rembrandt kind of interpretation, where you get more of an ex, uh, kind of an extreme. Remember, that's interpreting. That is what I call transposing. That's where you take what you have in an observation and you reinterpret it. So yes, you could separate, have a, a, a degree, an interval or two between all uh, the light, the 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 lightest part of the shadow and the darkest part of the light. I guess that's what you, yes, you can, there are all kinds of things you can do with composition that are very, that are just wonderful. But what I'm getting across here is the difference between being able to feed the artist with knowledge of what we can expect and then being able to use that uh, when we create our compositions. And we can make changes when we create our compositions. Musicians make changes uh, all all people who create make changes. That's part of where our creativity uh, comes to play. Okay, how much time do we have? It, uh, we have one minute. One minute. We have one minute. So one more question. 
One more question and we wrap this session up. Uh, Melissa, is there a similar thing to halftone happening in shadow tones that are shadows? Yes, they're similar. In fact, you're going to have the gradation there and you're going to have different degrees. We will be studying shadow tones, by the way, the next chat session. We'll be using shadow tones as our discussion. Um, but they are similar in the fact that they do have uh, they, they, they do change uh, from, the, from the shallow, from the transition in shadow, from where that transition is, as, the, as it moves into what I call shallow shadow. I like to interpret shadows as shadow, shallow shadow, moderate and deep, and then occlusion. Uh, we do have that gradation that takes place. We do have that continuum, and we do have changes. We'll have changes in colors as well as changes in values that we can observe. Uh, Rembrandt might say, Lisa, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. Could you practice Gasai method with five values and fi five values and five values, five being highlight, one to two in dark, half tones in between? You can do any kind of study you want to with any kind of continuum that you decide. I think it would be interesting if you take one subject and see how many different interpretations you can give it, just like questions that you're asking me right now, Lisa. That would be a marvelous study to do. It's it really you can learn more when you use a single subject, um, and maybe change the lighting conditions or change whatever, or just change the interpretation. And as long as it's visually comprehensible, uh, then you're you're good. Uh, let's see. There was another one that was oh that was part of the first one. You remember Brent might. Uh, have half tones differently. The Butch Rose and yes, all artists all artists have their own individual uniqueness when it comes to how they use that half tones and use their shadows. So you might find that uh, as you look through you look throughout the masters of art in our art history, you you might find that you will find that uh, every every artist has their own unique way as his and her own unique way of using halftones in order to express what they're trying to express. So you can find those differences just by using comparisons. But I bet this session will cre help create an awareness so that you'll start looking for these things now. So that's what I hope for. All right, let's see. Are we just about up? We're there. It's just the thank yous. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been a pleasure. I hope you'll all go out looking for halftones now. And find different ways to explore those halftones. So thank you all for joining us. Next month. Next month, uh, we'll have the chat. This is the third Sunday of the month. We always have the chat on the third Sunday. And just as a review, on the first Sunday of every month, you members, you expect your, your coupon code for your free video. And then on the second Sunday of every month, you can expect your snippet. And that snippet, most likely, we're going to try to keep it this way, is going to be a key to what the chat's going to be on the third Sunday. So we're trying to keep this kind of continuous as we go through. All righty. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll look forward to the chat next month. In the meantime, happy painting.